Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our conference uh, here at the Principia International Symposium. I'm very excited to have here with me Professor Nancy Nersessian from the University of Harvard and also the Georgia Institute of Technology as a guest for this conference. So, thank you, Professor, for um, accepting our invitation. Professor Nessessen describes her research as focusing on creativity, innovation, conceptual change, and learning in science, especially in interdisciplinary communities, which I'd say is a very creative, innovative, and interdisciplinary subject in itself. <laughs> she investigates the cognitive and cultural mechanisms that lead up to scientific innovation, both theoretical and experimental. Today, she'll talk to us about building analogies in vitro simulation modeling in biomedical engineering sciences. So please join me in welcoming Professor Nancy. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I can, in my imagination, simulate the thought experiment that I'm in Florianopolis, given the beautiful pictures we have of the place. However, I would certainly much rather be there. Um, particularly since, as I will say, so my talk is a little uh, different than I had planned in the sense that I had planned to bulletize everything and do my usual PowerPoint talk. However, I just made a major move last week, moving my entire household. The cabinets behind me hide the chaos that's in this, in this room, and every room is in chaos. So what happened was I got some things beautifully bulletized, but for the sort of more analytical concluding part of the talk, I'm actually going to uh, read what I, what I have written um, because I, my, I didn't have the brain power or the time to do it. So with that being said, um, what I want to do in this talk is to bring attention uh, to the epistemic affordances of the analogy building dimension of certain kinds of modeling practices in frontier science, which I think is kind of missing from the literature on models. Um, I started this in my book on creating scientific concepts, looking at conceptual models. But in this instance, what I'm going to look at is also a class of models that is not, to my knowledge and to my searching, appeared in the um, literature on models, either the philosophical literature on models, and that is in vitro simulation models in biomedical engineering sciences. So um, that's basically what I'm going to try to do in this talk. Um, so first for an overview, what I'm going to go through is I'm first of all going to discuss processes of building an analogical source model. As I said, I first uncovered this process of building the source rather than retrieving the source from a, a solved problem uh, by analyzing historical frontier problem solving and protocol studies leading to conceptual change. But now I've discovered that it's a much wider process. It's a widespread practice in problem solving and frontier science, where very little is known. So the epistemic practice I'm going to look at is in biomedical engineering sciences. It is of in vitro simulation modeling, and I will explain what that is as we go along. It is an iterative and incremental bootstrapping process of building something towards serving as an analogical source for understanding and controlling some uh, complex biological system of interest. And then finally, I'm going to talk about build analog models as epistemic tools. Um, I have done, uh, let's see, so I've got a bunch of stuff at the top of my screen. I'm, I'm assuming you can't see that and it's not hiding my slide. Um, so <laughs> cognitive ethnographies of bioengineering science. So what I have done is if I've tried to enrich the historical database that for which we typically draw on the public or the public published publications to look at science in action. I don't think philosophers, my argument in, in, in my book is I don't think philosophers should cede ethnography to the social sciences, that in fact it can be put to philosophical uh, use, looking at the problem solving practices of scientists and asking questions uh, that are relevant to philosophy. So we have done uh, 15 years of my, my research group and I of investigations of epistemic practices in the context of pioneering but university research labs. 
The two that I'm going to talk about today, well, I'm only going to talk about one, but are bi biomedical engineering area, tissue engineering, and neural engineering. And then our final study was in integrative systems biology, where the models are computational simulations. And one lab actually does its own wet lab experimentation. The modeler does it to feed their models. So these are what we call bimodal people. But I'm only going to talk today about biomedical engineering and their practice of in vitro simulation modeling. Um, this is a plug for the book that's forthcoming from MIT. You should see it in about a year. Uh, interdisciplinary in the making, models and methods in frontier science. Um, I don't have a cover yet, but I'm hoping that they'll use this image, which is drawn by something I will show you a little bit later. It's drawn by one of the in vitro model systems that I have studied. And it would be really cool. Uh, the researchers are letting me have it. It would be really cool if MIT can figure out a design for my cover. So that's my potential cover. Okay, so biomedical engineering sciences. Um, so, uh, let me just go back to here again. All right, so, so research in biomedical engineering sciences has dual aims, to develop understanding of complex biological systems and to manipulate control and intervene on them. In this respect, these fields aim at basic research while sharing the goal of application, which Mika Boom has claimed distinguishes the engineering sciences from the sciences. I concur that unlike the sciences, which philosophy has traditionally understood to have the objective of creating knowledge, the primary objective of engineering sciences is what I call getting a grip, to understand sufficiently to control or alter in specific respects, a pragmatic engineering goal. However, in many fields of BME, as in the labs we study, the application potentials are at most aspirational. And in some instances, they don't, do not even come into view until the research is significantly underway. This is because the basic biological phenomena are not yet sufficiently understood. Biologists are, are not interested in many cases initially in understanding these. And so the engineers have to figure out how to gain some understanding of these basic biological processes. Um, Research in BME often confronts the problem that it is not feasible or it would be unethical to carry out experiments on animal or human subjects. Importantly, such studies, even if possible, would lack the requisite kinds of experimental control. Thus, in order for an investigation to be possible, the biological system must be re-engineered in ways that manage the complexity of the biological phenomena. That is, researchers need to devise ways to emulate selected aspects of the in vivo phenomena to a degree of accuracy sufficient to warrant the transferring of outcomes of an in vitro experimental simulation to an in vivo phenomena. This is the analogical image in the form of provisional understandings and hypotheses. This is a complex interdisciplinary challenge. Our investigations examine how the kinds of practice, how specific labs in the fields of tissue engineering and neural engineering address this challenge. The kinds of practices we have examining, however, are not unique to these labs. Rather, our studies provide insight into the basic epistemic landscape of biological engineering. That is, the use of engineering concepts, methods, technology, strategies, materials, epistemic norms, and values to isolate and control biological phenomena so as to get a grip on complex dynamical systems. This, this presentation then examines specifically some of the processes through which the in vitro models of complex biological phenomena gain their capacities and their credibility. In our studies of two biomedical engineering university research labs, we found a common investigative practice is to create greatly but appropriately simplified living in vitro systems that parallel selected features of the in vivo biological systems of interest. So these are what our in vitro simulation models, locally called devices in the labs, from which they derive understanding about selected aspects of the behavior of the in vivo systems. Um, in this respect, they serve as fun structural, functional, or behavior analogs to in vivo systems. Um, these systems are epistemically, uh, first, well, first of all, these systems are built from processes that are incremental and iterative. That is, it's designed towards becoming an, anal an analog model. 
Um, building, building is a technical term we use. It comprises all these features, designing, constructing, redesigning, evaluating, and experimenting. It's shorthand, so I don't have to keep saying that all the time. These are the iterative and incremental processes. Building is itself a, bootstra a bootstrapping process. These models, the built models, are ontologically and epistemically hybrid. They merge concepts, methods, knowledge, and materials from biology and engineering. So certain select cells and tissues are made to interface with certain engineered devices in order for them to replicate or simulate functions of a particular biological system. So on my analysis, devices are built analog models designed to exemplify specific in, vi in vivo biological processes. Exemplification here is meant in the sense advanced by Nelson Goodman and extended to scientific practices by Catherine Elgin. BME researchers strive to design in vitro models that both refer to and instantiate features of the in vivo biological system germane to their epistemic goals. Researchers design and perform in vitro simulation experiments with devices in processes that they claim to parallel or mimic salient aspects of in vivo situations. Its exemplification then provides the criteria for evaluating in whether and in what ways a model can serve as an analogical source through which to investigate the target in vivo phenomena. These criteria assist researchers in determining what warrant they have to transfer inferences about the model to the in vivo system as provisional, as provisional hypothesis. So that's the gist of the argument that I'm making. Um, these built models are themselves complex dynamical systems used in experimental processes. And as I said, the majority of the research is figuring out how to understand the model and whether or not the model actually does instantiate the relevant features for the goal. And if it doesn't, in what ways does it not? In what ways does it? And does it matter that it doesn't in certain ways? An example is this, the flow loop device. I'm going to be talking about this a little bit later. But basically what this is, what this setup does, is it replicates the force of blood as it goes through the cardiovascular system over the lumen of the arteries. Um, it's used to study the effects of mechanical forces on, uh, on the blood, particularly the shear forces of the fluid of blood going over cells. Um, something that there was nothing known about, and that biologists, when this engineer first started saying it, biologists thought it was really, uh, they were studying the biochemical processes of cells. They thought this was hokey. Um, everybody today in the field of um, vascular biology believes what this research has established and is examining these forces themselves. Okay, so in vitro with simulation modeling though, um, as practiced, uh, uh, yeah, so the practice, I wanted to say something about the practice and about, and about my framing. So sometimes the researcher gives you a golden quote. It's just exactly what you're trying to say in a much more complex way, but uh, in very simple terms. Asked, what is it that you're doing when you're building this um, device here, this particular model? He said, putting a thought into the bench top to see if it works or not. So simulation in this case is not only of a biological process, but also of the researcher's current understanding, which fits very well with my notion of trying to understand reasoning as accomplished through complex dynamical systems of researchers, artifacts, and problem solving practices. And so the putting a thought into the bench top to see if it works is a very good characterization of distributed cognition. Um, I use the DCOG framework, uh, but I also contribute in, to it and develop it in my book. The analysis in the book, uh, Interdisciplinary in Making, focuses on models as the locus of cognitive, social, material, and cultural integration in these settings. Um, Building models, I argue, creates a complex distributed model-based reasoning systems. I look at these systems as distributed cognitive cultural systems with epistemic goals. 
but it requires some modification because the DCOG framework has not been used really to study epistemic practices. And epistemic practices have certain requirements, for example, building warrants and issues of justification that you don't have in studying other kinds of activities that DCOG. But I'm not going to talk about DCOG today. That's the whole first chapter of the book. I'm going to talk about the second chapter, but just assume this as my framing that might help you make sense of some of what I'm going to say. Okay, so in vitro, model systems. First of all, they are hybrid configurations of models. As one respondent said, when everything comes together, I would call it a model system. You would be very safe using that notion as the integrated nature, the biological aspect coming together with the engineering aspect. So it is a multifaceted modeling system. So I showed you the flow loop because there's another schematic of it. Um, it replicates the flow of blood through the, um, through the arteries, but it's not a model system until biological materials are put into the flow chamber. Uh, I'm trying to point here, and of course I realize you're not looking at me pointing, but down at the bottom, <laughs> there, there is the flow chamber. And I'm gonna talk about what goes in there. So when we put the flow loop together with cells, for example, endothelial cells, it becomes a model system. It's a hybrid model system. Another model system that we studied, but I wanted to show you because it's so sexy and the one that drew the image that I want to have on my book, this is a mechanical drawing arm. It's called Mayart, the living robotic artist. It has, it has had installations all over the world because it's an art project. On the other hand, if you look up in the corner, up in the corner, it shows the activity of, so the arm, for example, at the moment is in Australia. The activity of a dish of neurons is living in a, a lab in Atlanta, communicating via um, satellite to it, and it is controlling the motions of the arm and serving the function for research as an in vitro model system of embodied neural network learning. So that was the other system that we studied. This is a much more complex system, so I thought I would just use the simple one to uh, explicate today, but this is another whole chapter in my book. Okay, and to show you that this is not an esoteric practice that you know, only a few people use and died 10 years ago when we finished our work, um, this is a current in vitro model system, a very important one, a lung on a chip. Uh, it's, a, it's on a microfluidic device, so it's a tiny, tiny device, but it has the functionality of, low, of, of cells in our lungs, and it is what the bio, but, but the, um, the, um, uh, <laughs> the medicine producing companies. <laughs> it's, what, it's what they are using to test existing medications on the lungs to see if the medications can defeat COVID-19. So these are important systems, these in vitro simulation systems. All right, so models as immunological sources. As one of our respondents said, you know, what are you using the models for? She said, we're typically using models to predict what is going to happen in the system. That is an experimental model that predicts, or you hope it would predict what would happen in real life. So models must be able to simulate actual or possible behaviors of the epistemically relevant features in experimental simulations in order to serve their purpose. Models are designed towards becoming analogies. It takes a lot of work to actually get a model to the situation where it is simulating, and it does contain the features that you want. And there are various stages along the way, as we will see. Model systems are often nested analogies as well. So we saw the analogy of the flow loop, and we saw the analogy of the endothelial cells to the uh, vessels themselves, um, and they're put together into a, into a model system. So these are analogies within analogies. So we have to take them apart and sort of examine them and how they build together component ones. All right, so the standard account of analogical reasoning is we make inferences about what we don't understand, target system, in terms of what we do understand. Now, um, having gone to uh, Alejandro Cassini's talk yesterday, I'm not planning on being naive about targets, um, about what, you know, what they are in the world. Basically, for this case, the target system is the cardiovascular system. It's a system that we 
uh, understand in, in a conceptual way that blood flows circulates in the body, the heart pumps, uh, maybe some, some of those forces are uh, creating disease, for example, in the body. Those kind of things that we, that we generally understand, that, that's our target. So the target in this case would be um, what, that what we want to understand. But normally we, we understand it in terms of what we do understand, an analogy, a source. So the standard are you retrieve the source analogy, the solved problem, you retrieve the, 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 the problem of the solar system, you determine the mapping between it and the atom, um, you transfer hypotheses, and your uh, warrant is based on, for doing that, notions of similarity or relational structure or isomorphism. That's the standard view. Okay, what I'm saying is this is an understanding of analogy that's missing from the standard view. Problem solving on the frontier actually has to build the analogical source of base. There is no ready to hand problem solved. So models or configurations of models are incrementally built towards serving as the sources. These models need to exemplify features of the target germane to the problem so as to be able to simulate the target behavior. There is scant understanding about either the source or the target at the outset. Warrant for transfer is developed in the process of, uh, of uh, building based on the assessments of how and whether and to what extent these models exemplify the phenomena of interest. So it's quite a different notion of analogy um, but it's a very important uh, analogy. And in the, in the cognitive science literature, for example, it's not in the philosophical literature at all. In the cognitive science literature, the only person who's come to think about this issue is Doug Hofstetter. But he's used very simple programs like letter spirit in order to try and generate from, from a st start a source for generating new letters. Um, all right. So, then what I'm saying is in contrast to the regular view, uh, standard view, models in, the in vitro simulation models are built from the ground up. So there's no retrieval. And also, unlike the cases normally studied in philosophy of science, there is no theoretical basis of the domain. There is no theory of the domain from which they can draw their understanding or, or uh, derive models from theory. This is actually sort of trying to build the theory. Uh, mapping requires that the models be built to, in their words, mimic, parallel, emulate behaviors relevant to their epistemic goals. And the big question about transfer is their evaluation as they are building the models they are evaluating. Do the models possess the features germane to the problems at hand? So with respect to hypothesis transfer, then the important question is what enables the researcher to have some assurance that she's on a productive path with an in vitro model? That is, that it has the potential to provide understanding of an in vivo biological process. So to attain this epistemic goal requires that the built model do, does instantiate these features and that nothing essential is left out and that importantly maintain the biological functionality of the cells and tissues as they interface with these materials and perform under greatly simplified conditions. Very, very simple consideration is, does it keep the cells alive? Um, because otherwise the cells and tissues alive because otherwise you can't do the experiments. Um, and and um, but, you know, there are much more complex issues involved as well. Okay, so, um, I just wanted to make sure you don't have that Zoom stuff that I've got that's blocking what I'm saying here. Okay, so problem transformation. I want to just take you through the problem transformation of the model system I'm going to talk about now. Um, remember I said that the problem had to be transformed in such a way that a seemingly unsolvable problem can be made into a tractable, manageable one for dealing with a very complex biological system. So this is how things started and progressed in this particular case. Um, a mechanical engineer was working as an aeronautical engineer on the Apollo project. He was contacted by NASA. Well, actually he was working on something else, but he was getting money from NASA. So he was contacted by NASA and they said, hey, um, we wanna understand the effect of 
and re-entry and takeoff, particularly this pogo stick vibration on the cardiovascular system of astronauts. And this engineer said, why are you asking me? I know nothing about biology. And they said, yeah, but you know about forces. And this is about forces. So he started studying the biology. And in fact, at this point, this was in the 1960s, he began to morph into and became a pioneering biomedical engineer in the field of, um, of vascular biology um, and left his old engineering work behind. Okay, so he examines the, uh, the artery, and the artery has these components, particularly the endothelial lining inside on what they, it's called the lumen of the artery. Um, he decides to study that in cows. Um, he, the cows was a selection of choice because no one would work with him. They thought he was crazy. The only person who would work with him was a veterinarian who wanted some of his engineering skills. So what they did is they created stenosis in cows. Uh, they created the cow as an animal model system. They um, sacrificed the cows. They plasticized the arteries. They did Doppler studies and all kinds of things on them to try and understand what's happening with the flow forces. All right, that was messy and difficult and lacked all kinds of controls. So he decided to take the research in vitro instead. Um, this back in the in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, was a whole radically new way of looking at things. Could you, in fact, create these model systems that would replicate uh, the, the, the forces of interest and be able to study these phenomena? Um, along the way, he decided, we will see that the endothelial cells that he was studying initially were not sufficient. And you actually had to try and create or tissue engineer a vascular blood wall model that contained more of the components. So that was the next step. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, we're back to an animal model because if you really want to understand certain issues about the functionality of these, uh, of these uh, biological cells and tissues, then you need to find a model system that instantiates more closely the human system that is your target. And in this case, it was a baboon. So we went back to an animal model. Okay. So the model building challenges then are adapted to the problem you have to when you can solve. So in this case, he went from in vivo to animal to in vitro. And the animal other one is, is still in the vitro model system. Figuring out how to use engineering and biological concepts, not knowledge methods to design and build these systems and to determine the relevant features to instantiate the right level of abstraction and to interlock engineering, biological, and materiality, material constraints while maintaining biological functionality. We use the word interlocking models rather than integration because integration kind of says, you know, so there's a melding and a smushing up. Instead, what happens in these cases is that, you know, certain parts of biology, certain parts of engineering, have to be figured out how to fit together. Fit together. You don't integrate all of the biology or vascular uh, biology, or you don't integrate all of mechanical engineering, but you have to find the right interlock in order to be able to build these models. Whoops, that wasn't supposed to happen yet. Okay, so here's the original framing of the problem. The director said now by the 1970s, um, uh, what was really motivating was the fact that those characteristics of blood flow mechanical forces actually were influencing the biology of the wall of the blood vessel. And even more than that, the way the vessel was designed as an engineering piece in terms of design. So the interviewer, this was influencing the characteristics of the biology. And he says, yes, right. Influencing biological processes that were leading to disease. The way that, the, like arteriosclerosis, the way the blood vessel is designed, it has an inner layer called the endothelium. It's a monolayer. We call it a monolayer because it's one cell thick, but it's the layer in direct contact with the flowing blood. So it made sense to me that if there was an influence of flow, in this case, shear force, on the underlying biology of the vessel wall, that somehow that cell type had to be involved with the endothelium. That's the rationalization for starting with a model system that involves only the endothelial cell and not other components of the blood vessel wall. So the target problem then is 
biomechanics of blood flow in the in vivo artery or uh, hemodynamics. The source domains that he has to draw from are very least vascular biology, cell biology, physiology, fluid mechanics, and elastic solids. And the built analogies that we'll go through very quickly one by one are the in vitro simulation models are that flow loop, the flow loop in cells model system, this construct, which is the blood vessel wall model, and the families of models that these create then to create various desired analogies. They can be combined in different ways into what they call vascular construct model systems. So it's a whole family of model systems. Note also when I say construct tissue engineered wall model slash graph, they call it either way, because here their application goal came into view. So it wasn't until close to 2000 that, that an application goal came into view, that they might actually be able to create, well, they not create, but determine the requirements for creating a substitute artery that you could snip your diseased part and slap, slap this in and suture it up and everybody's fixed, as opposed to the awful stuff we have to do every day. Okay. So we saw the flow loop, but the flow loop, this is the compact version that was model revised to go into the incubator. His original flow loop was a gigantic tabletop thing. The problem was, um, you know, maintaining biological functionality, i.e. cells were contaminated and died all the time. So 50% of their experiments were wasted um, and somehow this had to be re-engineered. So one of the graduate students had gone to a lab in Japan that studied miniaturization and we came back, or well, when he came to this lab new, he said, oh, I can miniaturize that. So this is the system they were using still from 1995 with very little alteration. So the flow, here's how it um, acts as, a, uh, as, a, as a, an analog model. Um, it simulates the shear forces of blood. It doesn't simulate all forces, for example, like pressure, the pressure of the blood. Just the shear forces. The speed of the pump rep represents a range of potential blood flow. The pump dampener controls the constancy of the flow. The flow channel is engineered to exact geometrical specifications and a physiologically meaningful range for the endothelial cells in the artery. There's an incompressible fluid that flows through the channel, and that liquid medium has a viscosity of blood, cell-friendly pH, and other in vivo features. So this is how the flow loop sort of paralyzes. Okay, the model system itself, so they're, now I'm going to take you through some of their reasoning about what it is that they're doing. When we put cells in there, we put endothelial cells in there, we use the flow loop as a first-order approximation of the blood vessel environment, um, we try to emulate that environment, but as engineers, we also try to eliminate as many extraneous variables as possible. So in other words, they started out simulating lam laminar flow, constant, steady, smooth flow. Um, because it's a way to impose a well-defined shear stress across a very large population of cells, and they can base their inferences on the general response of the entire population. Okay, but... There are negative analogies. Blood flow in vivo is not constant. When it pushes out of your heart, it's pulsatile. Um, and, there, and there are eddies and currents, and, and particularly if there's constrictions. But uh, where it is constant or relatively constant is at your extremities. So it's replicating at least part of that system. But they know this is a negative analogy. Plus, things change constantly. That was the problem with the cows. Over a 24-hour period, all kinds of things go in in our bodies. And so it's not steady, um, which is also a, an uncontrolled thing for engineers. However, simulations can be made to instantiate higher order effects. If there's, a, if, if there's a reason for doing that, that is, for example, if a whole different pattern of genes are upregulated in post-tons here. Well, gene arrays are something that came in like the 1910s so they weren't able to investigate that, so they didn't bother with that. Once they were able to investigate that, they actually started doing simulations that were much more, uh, that exemplified many more features of the in vitro flow. So negative analogies actually are resources for development, important resources. So now about the endothelial cell flow loop model system. So it's the cell layer in direct contact, that was the rationalization, however, Cell culture is not a physiological model. 
Um, it's a model, though, where they can look at the responses under very carefully designed and well-defined laboratory conditions. That's why they're doing it that way. They, but they can study morphology and proliferation, but they can't study other access functionality, for example, like protein expression with any sense that they're getting anything that does exemplify what happens in the human body. So the negative analogies are there are missing known important components of blood vessel wall. But for many, many years of the research, 20 years or so, there wasn't any way to incorporate more. They tried making a co-culture with smooth muscle cells and um, endothelial cells, but that didn't give them the kind of information that they wanted. As they say, I'm calling this again a process of epistemic iteration, borrowing this term from Hassel Chang. I think that's a good way of talking about this iterative and incremental building towards. Um, so putting cells in plastic and exposing them to flow is not a good simulation. They have a natural neighbor, smooth muscle cells, and they communicate with one another. So basically the negative analogy is the model does not instantiate smooth muscle cells and blood vessel wall tissues. So at early uh, 2000, he decides to take the big gamble. To use this kind of, excuse me, Use this concept of tissue engineering to develop a better model to study cells and culture, to try to engineer a better model system using cell cultures. <clears throat> so put the endothelial cells in a natural culture, basically with their neighbors and other tissues. Notice he says use this concept of tissue engineering because it was, it was just an idea, okay? They hadn't actually tried to engineer living tissues with all of the components that tissues have. Um, he is also in his lab, is also a pioneer in tissue engineering, which is now 20 years later, quite standard thing to be doing. So they have a vision, let's build a construct, a tissue engineered vascular wall model, which opens the possibility also of a graft. It behaves like a native artery because it's one step closer to being functional. It's a family of models. You can instantiate all of the layers of a blood vessel, some of the layers of a blood vessel. It depends upon what your problem is, your epistemic goals. So and in itself, which I'm not talking about here, but I do in a chapter in the book, it led to a whole range of new model systems, for example, to assess the effect, assess the effects of pressure and strain, to investigate the forces of uh, wait, let me just say pressure and strain for us, because in tubular form, then you can look at the pressure and strain forces that are that are going causing the tissue to go in and out that you can't do on the endothelial cells at all. And with the graft idea, okay, uh, the endothelial cells become very important. Finding a source for them becomes critical because if you are going to have a graft, they are the most immune sensitive cells in your body. You can't take them from somewhere else. You have to figure out a way of either using stem cells or using the host's own endothelial cells in order to see a particular graft. So that, that's a whole line of the effects and forces on stem cells research that opens up here too. So as I said, that's a, that's a picture over on the left of it being uh, uh, cultured. They slip it off of that to use it in, uh, use it in uh, experiments and um, it can be instantiated with many of those le uh, uh, levels. Okay. However, as an epistemic tool, the big, big question is, how do our constructs act as a modeling tool? How do they respond to, or the biological markers respond to mechanical simulation? Does it respond in the same manner as in vivo? That's the big, big question. So for example, does it express the proteins and genetic markers? Does it possess the in vivo mechanical properties? Again, you know, does it instantiate what is necessary in order for it to exemplify the system sufficiently that we can transfer hypotheses about the understanding we gain from the model to the, to the uh, real world system? Okay, so there are numerous potential systems. One of the questions here, is there a negative analogy? To put it in that chamber, they actually have to cut it open flat. A redesign would be a major thing, they thought. Actually, it turned out not to be so major when they ultimately needed it. Um, but the, the question was, well, we can just cut them open and flow them back, 
flat, will that make a difference to the forces on the endothelial cells? And their claim is, no, it's not a negative analogy in this case. The rationale is that from the cell's perspective, the endothelial cell, it sees basically a flat surface. The curvature is maybe like one centimeter, whereas the cell is like a micrometer. <clears throat> so the cell has no idea that it's living in a closed world. Basically, the cell lives in a flat land. So the forces it experiences are those of a flat land cell. And so they don't have to worry about this particular negative analogy. OK, the final system that we studied uh, and the final system that was the culmination of bringing everything together was one that would instantiate more of the features of the cardiovascular system of humans. So they developed this baboon vascular construct policy. <clears throat> this is what she called an experimental model system that predicts what you hope would happen in vivo. Um, the problem is that a vascular graph requires a source of endothelial cells. We have progenitor cells in our bodies. They're immature cells all the time. Can they be made under the force of blood flow to express the anticoagulant proteins and therefore prevent clotting? So could, the, could my cells be used, my progenitor cells be used to give me a graph, to make me a graph? So could they be harvested from a patient? The way in which they uh, uh, express that is, can we build a more realistic model system? That is one that instantiates more relevant features to examine the progenitor cells function under the mechanical forces of blood flow. And so they created this complex system. I'm not going to go through every aspect of it, but I tell you to look at it straight on. As you look at the left third, that's all the things that they had to do to develop and culture a particular construct staying in tubular form so that it could be um, uh, inserted into an exteriorized shunt connected to the baboon. So if they don't put it in the baboon, they have a shunt connecting the femoral artery in the vein. So first of all, all that stuff goes on the construct. Then the construct is put into a modified flow loop. She found out by analogy, actually, all you needed to do was to add a shunt to the flow loop, just like you added a shunt to the, to the um, baboon, and you could control the forces. So they preconditioned the, the endothelial cells. They subjected them to the forces. Then they put it in the baboon uh, and to determine who was, who was you know, very far away and treated very humanely and you know, no, no baboon problems here. Um, uh, but the baboon as a model system or as a device um, to see whether or not platelets were formed. That is, is there blood clotting? Is there not this thrombomodulin protein expressed? If it is, and it was, the really important thing is now they knew that we evaluate, we used the shun to evaluate platelet disposition. Were the cells, as a function of the treatment, able to prevent blood clotting? And they found that using the normal time of range, but only the normal arterial shear rate, 15 dynes per square centimeter, actually produced no clotting. So that is it gives them a hypothesis that if the endothelial cell progenitor cells are seated onto a vascular graph, they will function as normal due to shear stress, which is the um, hypothesis that they're taking from this analog model system that instantiates all of the relevant features, all the features they consider relevant to determining an answer to this question. However, of course, it's still a hypothesis. It would have to be tested out in a human system or in whatever stages they would get, get to to get to a human system in a vascular graph. Okay, so that's giving you their reasoning and, and, and other things. So now that I want to return to is the issue of built, built analogical models as episode tools. And here I go to my paper. So First of all, that inference is warranted because the flow loop construct baboon model, model system provides a functional evaluation of preconditioned endothelial progenitor cells in an environment that parallels 
the human cardiovascular system. That is, the model system instantiates those features relevant to the epistemic mode of determining if blood flow forces turn those cells into mature endothelial cells with respect to the production of anti-clotting proteins. So, in vitro models are the primary means to which DNA researchers gain epistemic access to complex biological phenomena. The researchers build epistemic learning and model through the principal decisions and rationalizations they make in the processes of building them. The work for using these kinds of models and epistemic tools then is connected to how the models function as dynamic representations. That is, how they are built to instantiate and simulate in, vi in vitro features. What I propose is that for philosophers to understand how the practice can achieve its epistemic goals through model-based reasoning, we need to understand the affordances of episte the epistemic affordances of models as good analogies. In the words of our researchers, models are designed to parallel or mimic features of an in vivo phenomenon. I interpret their expressions to mean that in vivo, in, in vitro, uh, physical simulation models are built to provide structural, behavioral, or functional analog representations of selected dimensions of complex in vivo biological systems. They provide a way to get a grip on the behavior of biological system by creating a virtual world to which to conceptualize control and experimental probe aspects of a complex dynamic system. They are, to some extent, in the words of lab D researchers, that is the, the neural lab researchers, science fiction. But they can only function as epistemic tools if they have been designed with an appropriate representation of biological facts. Importantly, unlike computational virtual worlds, in vitro models are composed in part of biological materials. So the cells and tissues have biological functionality that needs to be maintained as they interface with engineered materials and perform under greatly simplified conditions, all of which figure into how they function epistemically. And to add a level of complexity, most model systems are nested analogies, that is, analogies within an analogy. For example, the flow loop provides an analogy to hemodynamics, the construct provides an analogy to the blood vessel wall, the model, and the model system they constitute provides an analogy to blood flow in an artery. So the considerations in play are not only about each model, but about how the model system fits together or interlocks. So what enables the researchers to have assurance that they are on a productive, some assurance, that they're on a productive path with a model system design? Despite their complexity, in vitro models are missing much of the target in the system. What we saw in our data is that researchers were continually asking the question I phrased generically as, is the model of the same kind as the in vitro system along the relevant problem dimensions? That is, are the features instantiated such that the researcher is warranted to infer that the behaviors of the model belong along specific dimensions to the same class of phenomena as those of the in vivo biological system? Answering that question requires an assessment of both the relevance of the features that are instantiated in the model to its behavior and of those that have been left out. As I argued in my 2008 analysis of conceptual analog models, I think the best way to interpret that question is as asking whether the built analogy exemplifies the features relevant to the research. In the sense advanced by Goodman and Elgin, X exemplifies Y means X both refers to and instantiates relevant features of Y. A paint chip, for example, both instantiates and refers to a selected color that is relevant to the goal of the painter to reproduce that color on a wall. The notion of exemplification captures the representational relation the researchers aim for as they build models to parallel or mimic in vivo phenomena. So the flow loop in performing not only refers to shear stress forces in processes of blood flow through the endothelial cells in a blood vessel, it produces those shear forces. The liquid is what the researchers judge to be the relevant fluid dynamic features of blood as it flows over the endothelial cell cultures or the construct device that has been designed 
to have the relevant features of the blood vessel wall. The in vitro models then are successful exemplifications if they possess the features of the in vivo phenomena germane to the problem at hand. And much of the research is directed towards determining if this is the case. Such determination requires the researchers to, continue, to consider the relevance of both what is and is not instantiated to the behavior of the system. What is not instantiated provides a potential resource for curvature development. Building in vivo models towards exemplifying features is a dynamic process. Models are satisfactory examples that are satisfactory exemplifications provide the researchers with warrant for analogical transfer of experimental outcomes. So analogy and exemplification work together in model-based reasoning. The VME practice that we've looked at, uh, epistemic practice of building devices and model systems is fundamentally an analogical practice. The researchers aim to design models to provide analogical sources that can help them gain understanding and control of complex biological systems. However, as I've noted, this analogical practice is quite unlike any considered in the customary philosophical and cognitive science literatures. Usually analogy is cast as a process of making sense of what we do not understand in terms of what we do, target and source. Here little is understood about either. The reasoner retrieves um, in the usual case, the reasoner retrieves a previously solved problem, determines a mapping, transfers features uh, to the sourcing target, and evaluates that with respect to the domain. Now, I want to say also that I think that's a rather simplistic thing, too, because as people in cognitive science have been finding out when they build in their computational models of analogical reasoning, that a lot of re-representation has to take place before you can actually map anything from a source to a target. But I'm going to leave that aside for a moment. So although models have prior and um, <coughs> although models have pride of place in contemporary philosophy of science, scarce attention has been directed towards the analogical dimensions of the models. Um, exceptions are the early work, of course, of Hare and Hesse and uh, the work in 2009 of Daniela Bailey Jones. I venture this lack of attention, and most recently, uh, Tarja Nicola and Andrew Lukitz have begun to look at the, the role of analogy in models. <coughs> I venture this lack of attention stems from the fact that the literature focuses on models derived at least partially from theories, which has brought to fore the uh, traditional representational issues associated with realism, especially the problem of how false models can support predictions or provide explanations. I have been arguing that starting from the other direction, that is building models from the ground up in the absence of the theory of phenomena under investigation, it underscores how analogies and models are tightly run. Additionally, as Hesse in 1963 pointed out in her groundbreaking analysis of models as analogies, the source model is always a false representation and that it cannot accurately or adequately represent all of the features of the target phenomenon. With her, I contend that the true, I contend that the notions of true and false are not appropriate categories for thinking about models. But neither is Hess's and the customary notion of similarity as an extensive philosophical literature that I won't go into here has been argument. It's actually not necessary to get into the intricacies of these discussions for our purposes, because BME models must instantiate relevant biological features in order to function properly. And so similarity is also not an appropriate category for the representation of relation between these kinds of models and in vivo phenomena. Um, okay. So I also want to say uh, the vast cognitive science literature and analogical reasoning is also does not contend to the, can attend to the creative work of building the source representation that is central to the kinds of analogies that I've considered. There, the standard analysis assumes that it's problem solving that these source analogies acquire. So, however, there is a significant representation building aspect of analogy for science 
for which several sources of data provide evidence. So that my claim is not based on the data from my arithmetic study, but also from historical case analysis, and also from the cognitive science literature of think aloud protocol studies of problem solving, in which scientists have been shown to try to build an analogy um, on the way to trying to solve a problem. So, um, although what we customarily understand as analogy occurs in science, that is, there are comparisons to what is ready to hand, for frontier research problems, there is often no such analogical source. Rather, the source of the lab itself needs to be created in interaction with the goals and constraints of the target problem, a process that furthers the articulation of the problem itself. So, in general, in the case that we've been sitting of in vitro simulation model, a satisfactory in vitro simulation model is one that exemplifies features relevant to the epistemic goals of the problem solver, which are, in the DNA case, ultimately to understand and control the behavior of the immune system. I've argued that exemplification provides the evaluation criteria for warranted analogical inferences, that is, for analogical transfer of hypothetical inferences. The researcher's assessments of whether the model exemplifies those figures relevant to the problem at hand that we saw that they develop all through the building process provides the basis for their inferences from the source to the target. Warranted predictive inferences, that is their epistemic goal, about the behavior of the immune system affords understanding as well as possibilities to control and intervene. Uh, we see a much we see this much later in a research project. So 30 years on, some control and intervention could take place, <clears throat> which could not at the beginning of these uh, projects. Um, however, the application goals, as I said, require a high degree of confidence in the outcome of a simulation, as well as ethical and practical considerations. So frontier, so in frontier research. The realization of these goals is often far off. Instead, the objective of the labs we have investigated, each during a five-year period, so uh, was, was by and large to understand and control the models themselves so as to provide better epistemic tools, that is to develop the models towards being better analogical sources that would exemplify more of the relevant features necessary to simulate the biological behaviors under investigation. Given the pioneering research nature of the research, in building the warrant for a specific in vitro model, for example, the construct of the building, researchers are also, importantly, building the warrant for a specific domain practice. So in this case, vascular and tissue engineering. Uh, they're building the warrant for that practice, that it can indeed, this in vitro practice and this tissue engineering practice can indeed provide us with understanding about complex biological phenomena. Um, so as well, as well as for the practice of in vitro physical simulation modeling across the spectrum of that kind of DNA research, like the human emulation on the chip system, the warrant for a model and for a modeling practice rests ultimately on the ability of the modeling methods to provide a reliable and successful basis for understanding the inference. Further, a successful practice of in vitro simulation modeling provides warrant for the broader epistemic project of biological engineering it exemplifies. That is, to use material, conceptual, methodological, and technological resources of engineering to get a grip on complex biological systems. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your talk, Professor Nersessin. And we have time for questions. As usual, I ask uh, participants to either type Q in the chat or F if it's a follow-up. So, Otavio, please. Fabio, I have to unmute. Okay. 
<laughs> Thanks, Nancy. This was a rich talk, and I I really like the 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 case studies, and I very much look forward to reading your book. Um, I have one question about the uh, the the ideal the, the sort of shift you're making on the uh, standard account for an illogical reason. Okay. Right? So, as you point out, it's crucial for the standard account. Uh, that we start from a targeted, um, uh, that from a source that we do understand, so we can then transfer it to the target. Now, once, as you point out, that in the frontier science, we, we just don't have that privilege, right? So because both the source and the target are sort of still in, in flux, um, then at that stage, uh, why should we even consider that what we are doing is any form of analogical reasoning, right? By the time that, as you note, when warrant transfer can be implemented uh, so that we already build up enough information uh, about the source so that we can then transfer to the target, um, then aren't we just back to a form of the standard understanding of analogical reasoning? So I'm sure I'm missing something here in the dialect. Yeah. Okay. So yes. So um, yeah. No. So I thought I've thought about that too. But what's interesting, and I think what is the the real crux of creativity in these science activities, is not that analogical transfer. It's oh. how you build the model to serve as the basis for that analogical transfer. So I want to enrich the notion of analogy to include building the analogical source. That is, I want everybody to understand. And in my Creating Scientific Concepts book, I look at a standard dunker radiation problem uh, that some people might know, and I don't want to go into that. But I show there that I think actually some source building goes on too um, in, in some of the cases that the cognitive scientists have studied, but have not understood that this that there is this building representation building dimension to analogy. As I said, Doug Hofstadter has recognized it. In fact, he was wonderfully a fan of my work on Maxwell in particular. Um, but yes, so what I want to say is, okay, yes, the transfer, because you don't have to actually figure out the mapping by the time you've got the whole system working and you've de developed the warrant and everything. You know the map. So that looks pretty standard. However, you know, all of the creative work that goes into building the model to be an analogical source is part of what I call the process of analogy and analogical inference. So it ties model-based reasoning and modeling to analogy in ways that I think we don't often think have thought about in the world. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Good to see you again. It's been a long time. Good to see you too. Hopefully next time we're going to see each other in person. Yes. <laughs> okay, we have uh, two questions. Uh, I believe one is from Andre and the other is from Kate. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I believe Andre was first. Yes, but um, Catherine can go, <laughs> can go first if she wants to. Um, but well, since I am already speaking, uh, thanks, thanks so much for the talk, Nancy. That was great. Um, I think I wholeheartedly agree with everything you said. Um, and I also look forward to reading your book. I was wondering, <clears throat> when you mentioned Doug Hofstadter's work, that got me thinking about um, the history of artificial intelligence and some of the, the differences Doug had with um, a lot of people, especially with Herb Simon and his idea of problem solving and whether you had to go to the neuronal um, level and whether um, creativity was involved uh, something more obscure in a sense than just rational uh, problem solving. And you you mentioned in, in, in uh, part of your talk doing a simulation, and I think you were talking about doing a computer simulation. And this whole thing got me thinking about whether you make a distinction between the, the, the very notion of simulation and analogy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think a simulation can be an analogy. Um, 
but I don't think it has to be an analogy. Um, yeah, I guess that's probably the only thing I have to say about that. Is it, is it, is it, uh, what are the purposes of the simulation? And so if the purposes of the simulation are to understand the real world phenomena, then the, there is a, there, there is an analogical basis there. So I look at the computational simulation models that these guys build, uh, the systems biologists actually have an analogical dimension too. That analogical dimension is behavior. The behavioral outcomes they want to transfer to the real world. So in that sense of simulation, but I know people like um, um, Hans Jörg Weinberger and others have talked about different kinds of simulation that um, I'm not so sure would qualify as analogies in the same way. Yeah, so if you are solving just an equation and trying to get a numerical result, right. uh, it wouldn't count as, uh, as, as an analogy. Okay, right. thanks. Great. Okay, thank you. Catherine? Uh, in this particular example, it seems to me that the interdisciplinarity is sort of um, using engineering science in the service of biology. But I'd like to know, do you have cases where you have feedback loops? I mean, you know, could, for example, what you find out about what's going on in these cases indicate something that would be of more general engineering interest about um, shear forces or something? I think it can actually, yeah, it can go two ways. So for example, um, you know, there's not, in, in these cases, as you know, um, the problem is, is that there's not as much interaction on the biology side as you would wish. But so, for, but for example, their findings about the effects of shear forces have led biologists to do all kinds of interesting experiments now, um, looking at the effects of shear force on biochemical uh, processes. And then that kind of feeds back into this research. So there's a little bit more of a two-way two -way street. Um, in terms of engineering, I think they can learn things about yeah, so I'm not so sure that I don't think they learn anything about fluid forces, except fluid forces in biological situations, which are somewhat different than fluid forces in in uh, in, uh, in, a, in a continuing mechanical situation. Um, but um, I think they certainly learn things about engineering design. No, that is um, how, how to how to craft and design and what kinds of materials one can use it in an engineering practice. Um, but I, I think that is about it. So the yeah, so the interdisciplinarity really comes from this is framed in a and mechanical in, in, a, in an engineering way. These concepts of materials are brought to bear, but they're brought to bear in interaction with the bio, biological materials and with also the understanding that we have at the current time about biological systems. So when they're talking about the target, they're talking about the understanding that we have about the cardiovascular system, for example, and the understanding that the biochemists have developed about endothelial cells. And they have to determine whether or not features of that understanding are relevant. So for example, the biochemists, so this is where they make points of comparison, for example, now that they can do gene arrays. The biochemists know what uh, protein should be expressed by an endothelial cell that's functioning normally in a cardiovascular system. So these people can now test and examine whether or not their systems do indeed express those proteins which is what that whole experiment about thrombomodulism is, is about with that group. Does that answer your question? I mean, it, it does, but it, it does, I mean, but but basically what I'm, I'm, I'm I, I don't know, it's sort of, it's not even a, a criticism of anything. It's simply that it seems as though engineering is more used as a tool than something whose own understanding is advanced through this process. And I don't even think that's a bad okay. thing. Okay, no, I think that's not true, okay? 
So the question is, what do you mean by engineering? No, what actually, what, it, it's what do you mean by interdisciplinarity? Well, what, what do you mean by interdisciplinary, but also part of this, what, that figures also in what you mean by engineering. So for example, tissue engineering is a field of engineering. So they have learned how to do it. They have learned the techniques, they have learned the challenges, they have learned the advantages, and my, my, et cetera. They have learned how to do this over the course of this research, for example. It didn't exist when they started. And there are lots of labs that do all kinds of tissue engineering. They weren't the only ones working on it. So um, now, in, in, develop, in doing tissue engineering, are there things that they come to understand about the nature of forces, uh, for example, that they didn't understand before? That I'm not sophisticated enough to tell you. Okay, uh, we have time for more questions. Okay, I'll ask another question if nobody else is. And that's about the, um, the negative analogies. Um, you said, and I think this is right. I mean, I, I also think it's very important that the negative analogies are, some of them are useful as um, devices for uh, development. Um, you know, here's some more stuff that we would like to know. Here's, you know, a little, um, a bit about how we might come to know it. Is there any way of telling which are the ones that are useful and which are the ones that are just junk? Yeah, so one of the things I had a problem with um, in, in thinking about this was, for example, you know, what are the neutral analogies? <laughs> <laughs> and we're the, the Hesse ones that are, so, so Hesse doesn't talk about negative analogies as a source of development. I've talked about that, and so has uh, Tari Mutu and Angela Leffers recently. Um, um, she talks about neutral. And um, to me, anything that you would sort of consider neutral wouldn't seem important at all. So the negative analogies are the ones they know to be important at the outset, um, or, they're, or they're very, okay, they, sorry, I shouldn't say that, that, that they assess at the outset, <coughs> is this important? So the negative analogy of flowing the construct flat, they determined actually was not important. So there's no need to really go through the level of work <coughs> that would be required to keep the construct in tubular form in that flow chamber because the cells are so teeny, teeny, teeny that they live in a flatland. And, they're, and the forces they experience in that flatland are exactly the same as they experience in the tube. So they don't, they're, not, they're not concerned about that. However, the endothelial cells, uh, negative analogy, um, we're the smooth muscle cells. They talk to each other all the time. They're really important to, to one another. So there are many things we can't say. We can say, okay, under the forces of flow, they change shape, they proliferate, but we can't say things about this communication, which involves things like protein production and all kinds of other things. So that analogy is really important. So I think what they do is, at least what we saw in all of the labs, including the computational model building. Um, we're leaving this out. We're leaving this out because it gives us better control or it simplifies our simulation uh, computationally or whatever. And we don't want to deal with this messiness. Now, and they use the word messiness. Now, if we leave it out, what are the repercussions of leaving it out? Ah, okay, maybe we shouldn't leave it out. So, uh, so that assessment is done from what I could see <coughs> from any sort of common sense uh, negative analogy. It's common sense that, of course, it's missing all the other stuff. So what does that mean? Um, it's flat, it's flat, it's not curved. What does that mean? Um, and so um, I think that it's just done by a one-by-one-by-one one by one by one assessment 
as they're looking at in what ways does this instantiate the features that are relevant to my problem goal. And my problem goal is to look at a fully functional endothelial cell. I'm going to need to include these things that are now considered to be the negative analogies. But again, that depends on do we have the engineering know-how and skills to do it? And they didn't for a long time until this concept of tissue engineering began to percolate up in the field. And they took the gamble to try and see, could they do it? And could they actually create a tissue? Thank you. So if I, uh, if I can ahead. just have a quick follow-up. I, uh, I, following up on Kate's uh, uh, point, I wonder if the neutro analogies uh, can actually have a, a, a more significant role. Because in a way, they may indicate things that need additional information, right? So, so far, the current situation is one, we don't know where to go in one way or another, right? So they may indicate at least path, paths where, okay, we need just to figure out more about this, right? right. And, and in that case, wouldn't that fit in interestingly with your point uh, that we discussed earlier? about the importance of building up the source, right? Right. So, right. so yeah, so so the, the um, I think I build this out more in the book, that so the negative analogies really drive the extension, an iterative and incremental building process of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, practice. So of the, right here we were looking at basically uh, 30 years of a practice, we caught five, uh, sort of five years of it, and then it went on for another five years before the guy retired. Um, so all along, so we, we, we developed an understanding of the lab history, which is very interesting because for them, lab history is hands-on. It's a resource for further development. They have to know why and in what ways they've made certain model systems, what compromises they've made, what negative analogies belong to that system. And then it may not be for five years before they take that history, of, which includes the negative analogy, and they use it as a resource for, oh, now let's develop this construct. And oh, by the way, if we have a tubular thingy that has all of the functionality of an artery, Maybe we can understand the requirements, not build ourselves, but maybe we can understand the requirements for, for an implant or a graft. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um, if, are there any more questions? If not, uh, Please join me in thanking Professor Nersessian for the great talk and great QA. Um, Thank you all will, for your attention and your questions. Thank you. Uh, we will reconvene at 2 p.m. Uh, local time, Brasilia time. And uh, we'll have sessions in all five all five rooms, except that in this one. Uh, Talks begin a little bit later at uh, 2.30 p.m. local time. So thank you once again. And All right. You thank you. Thanks. Great seeing you, Nancy. See you later. All right.